from the former convent of the Good Shepherd overlooking Inwood Hill Park here in New York City. Welcome to Inwood Artworks On Air. It's where we meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes who make their home in what we affectionately call Upstate Manhattan. I'm your host, Aaron Sims, and today we welcome librettist, director, and playwright, Morella Martin Cook. Originally from Los Angeles, Morella is an Inwood-based librettist, director, and playwright that has been praised by the press for her, quote, cleverness in constructing humor for opera from the DC theater scene, end quote, for her 20-minute opera, Pepito, written with composer Nicholas Lel Benavides for Washington National Opera at its Kenny Center premiere in 2019. Marla also wrote the lyrics for Marianne Dashwood, Songs of Love and Misery, and Eleanor Dashwood, two song cycles written with composer Aphrodian. Her short opera, 10 Minutes in the Life or Death of, with music by Tyler J. Rubin, premiered at West Edge Opera's Snapshot in 2021. Furthermore, she has full-length opera works in development, which includes an adaptation of Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility, um, and with a commission, Dolores with Nicholas Lel Benavides and the 20th Avenue with Michael Lancy. In addition to her work in opera, Morella is also the book writer lyricist of Adam and Eve, music by Min Hui Lee, and one act musical that has been developed by the Duplex, the Crane Theater, Catwalk Institute, and Access Theater. Her short plays include Night and Friend Animals. Last but not least, Morella is the founder and director of The Rally Cat, an energized, multidisciplinary performing arts company that inspires and empowers artists and communities through opera, musical theater, and theater. We're going to talk about her work as a librettist, The Rally Cat, and so much more. But first, let me welcome Morella to What Works On Air. So good to see you. Hi. Thank you so much, Aaron. I'm delighted to be here. Oh, well, how are you? Amazing. It's great to see you. It's the first time seeing your face in person in a long time. Hello. <laughs> it's still there. Still me. Yeah. Um, it's wonderful. And I love being here in the former convent. I spent six years at a Catholic girls' school, so the convent feels like home. You know what to do. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great place here. And Good Shepherd's been so, um, I have to say, like, It's wonderful to have people who get what we do and are supporters of arts and culture in the community. And so uh, appreciate the the archdiocese here of the Catholics here to get behind us and in what artworks and providing a space for art to keep be cultivated and get out there in the community. Because yeah, I feel like um, not just you, but you know, Inwood itself is a big character in our play of our podcast and Mm -hmm. uh, showing off um, places that people may have never seen or never been is part of that. So big props to Good Shepherd for helping us out here today. Um, So you've created an exciting body of work for opera and theater. Um, Do you follow any hard rules when you write? Hmm. In In a way, the answer is no, but I do think there is one rule that I keep first and foremost, which is, is it true? Am I being truthful with what I'm saying? Are the characters being truthful? Um, I think structurally, we have a lot of choices, right? Especially today, there have been so many structures and forms passed down over millennia um, for humans to work with that I can decide what rhyme scheme I want to use, if I want to use a rhyme scheme, if I want it to have an Aristotelian structure, if I want it to feel more um, abstract. I have all these choices that I get to make, but the important thing for me is, is what I'm doing in service of the truth does it feel truthful is it is it what i understand to be true or what the people that i'm working with a truth that we can kind of agree on together so i'm really guided by folk songs um i'm a very amateur banjo player like like i cannot play (laughs) but i have a banjo and i strum it and i wail periodically that's amateur yeah that's a good definition yeah like the love is there um um but but i i do respond a lot to folk songs and Sometimes when I'm working, I think, you know, am I getting too heady or could could I simplify this? Is this something that can be expressed in a folk song? You know, I love you. That's sort of a level of direct honesty. And I think also uh, less encoding to an encryption and, sto- and, uh, and clarity of storytelling too, right? Mm-hmm. So that getting down to the truth of what something is without having it being muddy. Yeah, and exactly. And it, I'm sure the definition of muddy from person to person like could change, but I, I like to be a direct talker <laughs> as much as I can. You, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Who knows what I'll I hear say you. next? Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's part of why I write is because 
I think too, it's everybody goes on a journey of like finding their voice, finding how they speak, what they have to say, what they care about. And now that I'm in this track, on, on this track, on this path, um, it's always just that, like what's true, what's true. I think that's kind of interesting too, because uh, that that's kind of like your hard and fast rule in a way, particularly because you're librettist for m- musical works when, and it's not, you can say this is true or not true for people, but um, when people are singing is because they could not speak any further and they have no other choice but to pronounce their feeling through song and that is a truth for that particular character and moment uh, to be expressed because there is no other way. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting that the form you write predominantly in, not that you don't write in other forms, as we talked about, um, has that kind of underlying, um, it's a vehicle for truth. Yeah, and like I think my relationship to truth is informed by my training as an actor. That's how I started, and the idea of subtext. And for me, that ties into truth, right? Like what... What are we saying versus what's underneath what we're saying? Why are we saying what we're saying the way that we're saying it? Um, and that's just endlessly interesting, I think, in life and on the page um, as a as a thing to get obsessed with. I couldn't agree more and even more so why something's not being said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, when you write with a composer, you get even more leeway because I can say, I can have a parenthetical that's like, it's as if the world is ending or something like really dramatic. And then that person, you know, decides what does that mean? Do they want to go there? Do they want to open up this chasm? Is this character's world ending because they're so shocked or they're brokenhearted or like what's happening? And so we get to kind of I think you have the best of both worlds because I get to say things with text how I want to say them. And then I have a composer there to kind of be like, ooh, but like chord, you know, <laughs> like yeah. this is what's under there. And that, that, that furthering the truth of the expression of it, right? Mm-hmm. That's pretty awesome. And uh, what is your relationship like with the composers you work with? Uh, obviously, it's a good one because you seem to be working with a few back to back all the time. Thank uh, you. So we can always say that you do a good job. Um, but uh, what is that relationship like for you? And um, it's a process question. You know what I'm saying? It's more like, how do you get, like to work with the composer? And how do they like to work with you? Like, what's the relationship like when you're mm-hmm. creating a piece and working towards that truth? I certainly think um, it's been interesting because I, I came to writing in musical theater and opera from a background as a performer and a director. And I went to NYU. And in that program, the musical theater writing program it's a master's program and it's basically like speed dating the whole first year they pair you up with all the other composers in your class so you write one song or up to like a 20 minute musical with a number of people like 15 people um, on the other side so you learn a lot about how you like to work how other people like to work where you do not gel (laughs) where you do Um, and I've discovered I can be pretty adaptable Um, I like to get to know people um, and figure out what's useful for them. Um, For me, I just really value communication and the people that I write with do too. Um, We like to ask each other how we're really responding to what's being developed, what we both care about, what that idea is that we're trying to put out in any moment or that we're trying to uncover and like what are the questions we're teasing, what are the reasons why we're doing what we're doing um, and that's that's a constant um, with anybody that I'm I'm working with, um, and then different people draw different things out of me, um, which I'm really grateful for because that's an opportunity for growth and change. Um, for instance, Nick um, Nick Benavides, who I've been writing with since 2018, when we got paired up to write Pepito um, for the American Opera Initiative, Nick is a brilliant um, brilliant person who's able to kind of analyze things without detaching from the emotional content as a composer and so like he'll ask me really probing questions I feel like I can't get a syllable past him like if it's not good it's not good we're gonna find another thing he'll talk he's respectful I don't mean anything like that but um I love working with him because he's always challenging me you know and um he'll say he'll be honest with me and and we've built that trust over the past four years but you know we'll go through some scenes and he'll say like I'm I'm processing the scene a little bit give me just a second to think about it and then I'll say yeah like I have concerns about this character and then he will be able to verbalize exactly why it's not working and 
we can both move on. And yeah. I'm so grateful for that level of honesty. Honesty is big when you're working with someone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, big time. And trust. Yeah. And that trust. And, and it takes time to build that trust. Mm-hmm. So speed dating is good. Yeah, speed dating <laughs> is great. You really have this, ah, this was terrible, like kinds of moments. <laughs> and I had some really funny conversations in year one where sometimes my writing partners and I, we would debrief at the end and be like, I think we have different values aesthetically, and I think that's okay. Like, yeah. I respect what you're doing, and I'm going to work on work on this thing. Um, yeah, but that's, I think it too comes down to friendship. Um, I definitely consider the composers that I've worked with like friends. Uh, we have a very collegial relationship, and that's where some of that trust gets built. Is like, it's not, I pick up the phone and somebody says, I want you to do A, B, A, B, you know, stop, right. stop the blank verse I need an ABAB and then they hang up they're like how are your parents <laughs> how's your cat like we have we have actual bonds and friendships well even more important is the real life the real life world that informs the work right mm-hmm. and those people who help yeah. you create that work yeah very cool exactly well as I mentioned you've done a ton of work um, Thank and you. we could spend uh, make this a 12 part podcast series just about the work you've done, but we only have one. So, uh, oh my goodness. Well, maybe, t- maybe some other time. Um, so, uh, lately, uh, in December 2020, through the Rally Cat, uh, you released a digital concept album adapted from Jane Austen's Sense Sensibility called Eleanor Marianne. Uh, it's with libretto by yourself and music by FRDM. Uh, how did this project come to be? And also, it's a loaded question to say, how did it come to be in that form? Mm. Uh, and because mm-hmm. was, was, was it always intended to be a digital project? Mm-hmm. No, no, COVID. <laughs> COVID happened. Um, no, we, so I primarily write for the stage. Um, and I love that because I love the dynamic of being in space with performers yeah. and musicians and audience members. And I do not feel there is any substitute for that. Um, we can do digi- digital programs and th- they are meaningful. It's not that they're meaningless or they're not real or they're not live, but they don't feel like the real thing. Isn't that a, a lyric? There's nothing like the real thing. You yeah. Know? Um, and I feel that way. Ain't nothing like yeah. the yes. real thing. Yes. Oh, yes. Ain't nothing like the real thing. And so it was, it's been for everybody. I think we all feel this, you yeah. know, in different ways. And um, so particularly in classical music, um, I'm being a small company. I should start there. The Rally Cat, right? Um, yeah. We are a small um, but mighty um, multidisciplinary performing arts company. Um, we use opera, theater, and musical theater um, to facilitate creative expression in ways that empower artists and audiences and kind of break down the walls between the two. Um, I don't want to just be writing in my room and getting to be a librettist. I want other people to also get to be librettists. Um, and I care very much about like giving back to other people in the community and sharing with the young people. Although I hate saying that cause I feel young. I want to be totally young. young. I'm totally, I'm super young. Um, so, so that's all like really important to me and, and what the company is about. We kind of combine education and um, production or development. We're really more of an incubator though, I think is what we've grown our way into of being a space where artists can find community and kind of build trust in a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary way. So we had applied in fall of 2019 when, you know, we were all having a lot of ideas about what our lives would be like that would not come to pass um, in the next couple of years. And Avery um, who I met in grad school at NYU, and we had a great collaboration. We like knocked it out of the park. You know what I mean? We were just like, I love you <laughs> like when we first started writing together. He and I had been working since 2015 on an adaptation of this book because Jane Austen is a genius um, who was very, very underrated in her time um, for many reasons, but probably mostly because she was a woman. Um, and she wrote a series of books, which we all, you know, have read or heard about, um, Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, Emma. Um, we got some real Persuasion fans out there, so I have to mention that one. Um, but personally, Sense and Sensibility has been very close to my heart because it's the story of sisters um, and the bond that they share and how deep that goes despite how wildly different siblings can be. And so Aphrodian is an older brother. I am an older sister. We both are very familiar with that dynamic. And it turns out he was also raised on Sense and Sensibility. His mother watched it all the time. Um, So he knew that movie 
frame for frame, you know, and, and the book as well. And so we started exploring it in 2015 at the suggestion of my younger sister, Megan, who is a mezzo-soprano and wanted to play Marianne Dashwood because, of course, <laughs> um, Marianne Dashwood is, I would say, the more fun role for sure. Um, you're familiar with yes, this? Yeah, yeah. So. Marianne's crazy. Like, I'm a Marianne. I can say that. Like, she's wild. She's living life to the fullest. She is exuberant. She is mad, you know? Um, and so my sister was like, I want you to write this for me so that I can have a lot of fun in my master's program. Um, and after Deanne said, of course, I'm super on board. And so we started. And then I'll be honest, I was nervous to go in, into the Jane Austen world because I was afraid that I would get kind of um, categorized as a female writer, like writing adaptations of Jane Austen. I didn't want people to think of me as like, now Now I think I should be so lucky to be categorized like that because... Um, the work is incredible. Um, but at the time, I was nervous. And Averdeanne talked me into it. And he kept saying, I think we have more to do here. I think we should keep going. Can't we do Can't we do a full length? Um, but surprise, surprise, um, most people are not out dropping commissions on unknown writers um, mm -hmm. to write 10 character operas that will take three hours um, of musical time to produce. And so we decided to scale back, which is when in 2019, we said, why don't we put two song cycles together? And kind of see what happens um, and share that. And so Lower Manhattan Cultural Council very generously supported the project with a Creative Engagement Award. And everything would have gone super, super well um, live had had this all not happened. But it ended up becoming a real um, blessing for us to have this space to kind of rethink it. Because we ended up doing things we would never have done before. Um, it was supposed to be, and I am going on and on like a writer does. So oh, thank you for the, the moment. Um, I will get to the end of this, but there originally we were going to do a six or seven piece instrumental ensemble. And it was just going to be kind of like, take the Marianne Dashwood song cycle, take the Eleanor Dashwood song cycle that we had written and put them sort of side by side. And it's going to be really lovely chamber music kind of a thing. Um, and then we realized with the, size of the rally cat with the budget of the rally cat we could not afford the risk of doing that live and having that many people in one space um because we have to think about rehearsal time invested and then also booking a space and then covid protocols and extra testing and and all of the things that go into that and our budget is still pretty small um and so afridian again with his good ideas he said oh, that's all right what if we what if we did a a really high quality recording. And what if I wrote it for two pianos? So we get the number of instrumentalists down from six or seven to two. And I'm like, well, that sounds good. That's two fewer people or four fewer people to worry about getting COVID, um, you know? And I mean, for anybody out there, there's a reason we don't do things with two pianos, which is that you have to find a place with two pianos anytime you want to rehearse and they have to be tuned together. And sometimes costs a lot of money to move another piano and so that was a whole journey that we went on together um but I think it was worth it like I I'm really excited about what we have now and we ended up expanding it we doubled the length of the piece um in that 18 month period while we were figuring out what we were doing um and it really allowed us to go deep into the psyche of these two women and what was driving them and what they had lost and who they were becoming well I think you set up perfectly the need to hear this material. Uh, we would love to share a selection from your wonderful show with our audience. Uh, and this being a podcast, we can do these things. Uh, so could you tell us um, what we would be about to hear from Eleanor and Marianne? Great. Thank you. Well, we are going to hear some Two Piano Madness. Um, this is one of the sections that is my favorite in, in the piece. Um, what happens in the story is Eleanor and Marianne's father passes away. That's the inciting incident for everything. It's a sudden and unexpected loss, and they lose their home because at the time, estates were entailed to the oldest male relative, and there was nothing that could be done or negotiated. It didn't matter that they had nowhere to go. Um, so after they move to a much more, uh, just a different climate that to them feels a lot more rural than <laughs> where they had lived before, um, Marianne falls head over heels in love with like the sexiest man in the neighborhood, um, <laughs> Willoughby. And he is young, he is hot, he is intelligent, he's funny. He's a little bit of a 
little bit of a jerk, like just enough to be interesting, um, but never to her, just to other people. And they just go nuts. And her reputation is called into question because she's spending so much time with him, sometimes unsupervised, unchaperoned. Um, there's a really scandalous thing where she goes to his house without a chaperone what? and takes a tour. And this is like Regent Sierra, England. Um, so everyone assumes they're engaged. Okay. And then all of a sudden, one morning, he asks to meet with her. And when he meets, he just says, I'm going to London. Bye. He doesn't give an explanation. He's very upset. Everything's crazy. And that is what you're about to hear is the moments after that revelation. All right. So let's listen to the track, Willoughby is Gone. You were just listening to Eleanor and Marianne, uh, a track called Willoughby is Gone, music by Aphrodite Ann with libretto by Marilla Martin Cook, inspired by and with additional text from Jane Austen's Sense Sensibility, um, which I must say was directed by Tim Cook and uh, produced by the Rally Cat um, with Megan Martin as Eleanor Dashwood Douglas, um, Sumi, and uh, piano, uh, Eleanor Jana McIntyre as Marianne Dashwood, and Sherry Rowe as piano Marianne. So um, I want to mention that this project um, was a long gestation process for a project, and the fact that it's come to this point, I think there's uh, there's blessings to be found in challenges, and um, there's by all means no reason why you still can't do this live on stage, uh, but perhaps... Um, are there things now that you've learned by the length and, and then incorporating it as digital work that you want to um, uh, include or omit in a live stage version of it? Mm. That's a very good question. Um, where we are right now is this is what we're calling phase three of a five-part Jane Austen extravaganza in our lives that could truly take a decade or more for us to complete. Um, this is because Aphrodite Ann is like, he's a dreamer. Like we are dreamers together and he's the person I go to, to just dream with. And we, we dream big and it takes time. So this, this is sort of a complete thing, the album. Um, and we don't see the, this version, Eleanor and Marianne as changing too much. Um, but what's coming after will incorporate the lessons and the growth that we've had from from this process um, because there's always more to explore in Jane Austen's work, I think in particular. Mm -hmm. um, she, she spoke about how she was kind of confining herself to a very small area, but she was living richly there. Um, and we have certainly found that to be true where we've learned so much about these women over the past 
seven years at this point, um, that there's always more, there's always another direction. Um, but this process was very special because the musicians that were involved just elevate it so to such a high level. Like um, what you just heard is insane, especially when you consider the truth, which is that we had three short rehearsals um, for the entire 55 minute piece. That's ins- that's wrong. It's like morally wrong. I've but, been there. I get yeah, it. You know, like, um, and uh, Doug, actually, um, Doug Sumi had been with the project since the very first iteration, um, just like Megan. Um, he had been her coach at UCLA in her master's program. And so when we were doing this, one of the main concerns Aphrodite and I had was we're like, we know how crazy and wonderful singers are and that somebody, hopefully Megan and Janet McIntyre, um, will say yes. But what pianist is going to do this? Um, and for Doug to come on board and actually to bring um, Cherie, um, who's based here in Harlem, um, yeah. in Uptown, um, was just a godsend. Well, and I think, too, it's like you find collaborators you want to keep moving the project forward with. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I want to go back to something you said earlier. I, said, I don't think you should be ashamed at all about working on another yet another sense sensibility adaptation either because yes there probably is a hundred of them out there or if not a couple hundred Mm -hmm. um but there should be it's great source material why do you think people keep adapting romeo and juliet over and over again or hamlet or whatever you want to say which is different because those are plays and this is a book um but there's other there's numerous different stories and and yes many jane austen books get adapted for the stage because they're great stories. Uh, so I think this has been a wonderful opportunity for you to stretch your legs um, and your your creative muscles flexed. Um, and I, there's no reason why these, you can't work on this the rest of your life if you wanted to. Um, so I just we might. I, 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 well, my point is like if if it's still you know it's something that you all find exciting and meaningful. Why not? I mean, why not? And you will always find really cool crazy piano players to play for you. I will say that. They're out there. Yeah. They want to play. They really want to play. Um, well, I want to mention that this project um, was showcased as part of a mini online season digitally by the Rally Cat, uh, and, and which included works by the Rally Cat Creative Lab. Mm-hmm. And you touched upon like the kind of structure and the why of why Rally Cat exists. But can you tell us more about the lab and its focus? Yeah. Um, the lab started in 2018. Um, We had what's called Volume One, um, which was a group of eight artists. Uh, We had actors and writers and directors and a dramaturge, Ellen Mullen, who you know, Inwood artist. um, Totally. uh, Filmmaker as well. um, Amazing. And a choreographer. And it was important to have people with different focuses um, be in the room together so that we could kind of release ourselves from the super specific style of feedback that can sometimes arise in one space or another. I think it can be easier for people outside of a discipline to celebrate what's going well. You know what I mean? Um, As opposed to just focusing on what's there to be adjusted. Um, So it was a really cool space because we would meet a couple of times a month. And in those meetings, whomever wanted or whoever wanted to present could. And whoever wanted to use the time for, you know, whatever it was, they just got to decide. And so, for instance, one week, Tim Parker, who's an amazing composer lyricist who we featured this season, um, Tim showed up one week and he said, "Uh, this week I I have a little bit of a quagmire. And then he started to share a situation that had arisen for him professionally as an artist and just to kind of have space to get perspective from a couple of people about what he was going through. Um, And that was really a special day. Um, There was a day where Tim Cook, who directed the um, Eleanor and Marianne performances and who is my husband, so lucky me, Um, but he was there and he he had us do um, a reading of, and now I can't remember the Oh my goodness, it's that Christmas play, Thornton Wilder. Super beautiful. I uh, and so now you're sorry. putting me on the spot. Yeah, I know. Um, I was like, I know you know I, theater. I, 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 I do know Thornton yeah. Wilder. It's not Skinner yeah. Teeth, is it? No. No, it's, maybe um, it's not Thornton Wilder. Maybe I'm uh, all confused. I'll have to find out. Okay. I'm sorry. But once, um, Tim yeah. had everybody do a reading of a play that he hopes to direct someday and oh, just talk about that. Um, Ellen Mullen brought in 
scenes from something she's developing called Rager Size that's like a, an aerobic catharsis. And the choreographer in the group responded to that and started choreographing different compartments that could be put in or taken out. Um, and it's just, it's all about kind of like, it's like show and tell. It's like preschool and sharing, you know, um, but with the skills of adults and the focus of adults. Um, and it was super, super fun. So when we had the, again, when the pandemic came, we took a break for a while. Um, and then when we decided we were going to do a mini digital season, um, I reached out to a couple of the artists that we've worked with from that lab uh, and said, you know, what what's happening with you? Do you if we had if we had studio space, which I knew we were going to have um, because of Eleanor and Marianne, there, we couldn't have the singer sing 10 hours a day like wrong morally again but also just well, like, i don't know maybe yeah. <laughs> it depends on like, yeah. how kind of producer you are yeah yeah right exactly i'm like mm, uh, i'm gonna say no <laughs> for that um but but we knew we'd have a little bit of extra space so i was like yeah. you know tim parker do you have anything min we lee do you have anything like what's what's going on with you um and so min was performing in a show and couldn't use the space right then um she was doing baby with out of the box um theatrics and Tim Parker said, oh, yeah, I, I got something. I could have something. Well, flash forward to, you know, a couple months later, and we're in the studio, and rec we're recording these songs, and Tim did not have anything. At the point when he said he had something, he didn't have anything. He wrote that in the time. He wrote that and, like, so much more. He had had an idea, but because we had a space and we had an opportunity, he created this gorgeous work, which, in fact, um, also involved another Inwood resident, um, Ben Roseberry, um, who is just – an incredible multi-talented you know singer and writer himself and so ben came out and did this beautiful song and we're all like crying in the studio like it was one of the best songs i've heard in in new work you know and this all just happened because we had space and there was an opportunity you know and i love that and that's the spirit of the lab is like once you've been in the lab then you're always part of the rally cat you're always part of the lab you're part of like that volume of the lab and my goal is to start, uh, you know, volume two of the lab later this year. Awesome. Well, is there is it open to submissions or do you have to go through a certain process? Yeah, we're actually developing a new submissions process because the first time I, I just asked people as is often It's a good case, process. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I know, hey, I know you. I know you're cool. Like, um, That's but the first step. Yeah, we'd like to open it up um, more democratically. And so... I'm working with the artist council and the existing lab members to figure out what that would look like. Um, but one thing that I know for certain is we will not be asking anyone to submit project proposals or work on spec um, because that happens too much. Um, and I think there's a reason that that happens, which is that if there's actual money going into it, the company needs to know, like they need to know what they're producing. Um, but the way that the lab functions currently is that there is no stipend. What you're getting is the community and the space and then future opportunities as you see fit. But it's more about the bonds between artists and the support that you can find for your work. And then having the amplification of association, you know, and being part of a collective of artists. Um, so we can do it that way. We don't have to, you know, I don't need to know what you want to write about um, yeah. before you come in because... I don't have any money to commit to producing it right, right now. You know, it's just kind of like as things come up. Do you want help or not? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to chill? Like, do you want to hang? Like, yeah. this is a... Well, it's an this incubator. Is a, yeah, it's, it's an incubator, incubator in many ways. It's yeah. a house party. Like, you, you know, um, but... But you're bringing the beer. Yeah, yeah. You're bringing the beer. Um, and the beer is your work. And we'll bring our own beer, which is joy. Well, you're hosting. You're the host. Yeah. So... It makes yeah. sense. People should bring the beer. Um, and all kinds of drinks. Uh, <laughs> end of metaphor there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think it's fantastic. And I can, can just tell you how proud I am of you and how wonderful um, the work is that you're doing and giving an artist a place to um, feel positive about their work and f uh, opportunities to create um, the perfect story you said about, you know, the guy had nothing and all of a sudden you gave him an opportunity and it opened the door for the creative juices to flow and to create something. And that would not have happened had you not have established this um, opportunity, we'll call it setting the table for, mm. it, for, it, for it to be um, done. So uh, 
I think it's been uh, it's awesome. And uh, can we tell people where to go to find the Rally Cat and other things you are uh, and all the things you personally do? Where can we oh. send them on the interwebs? Yes. Um, please go to therallycat.org. Um, it is spelled like rally, R-A-L-L-Y. Um, we always keep that up to date and we'll have more information about the album soon because we're going to be making that available again um, later this spring. Um, you can also go to YouTube. I would love it if you subscribed to our YouTube channel because then you can hear everything that we have as it comes out. Um, and that is just on YouTube as the rally cat. Um, and, and it's free and it's free. Yeah. Love that. Um, and you'll be able to hear Tim Parker's songs that I was just talking about. Um, and Inwood legend, Ben Roseberry. And yeah, it's just, we're going to keep uploading that and, and keep putting things together. I also want to take a moment to thank you, Aaron. Um, you've always been so kind and so supportive and really answered me honestly, which is really helpful um, when somebody will tell you why why you might want to think about even sharpening what you're doing, you know, and and um, being realistic about space and time and cost. And it's really helpful. Um, not enough people understand that it's, it's kind to be truthful. And like, as I've said, truth is one of my core values. Um, also, we had a wonderful time in collaboration with you doing Starting Your Song um, a couple of years ago. And after Deanne and I, that was a beautiful bright spot for us in a very uncertain time as well, um, to be able to come and partner with you and have the strength of Inward Artworks and the community that you've built here um, and really feel rooted in that. So thank you. Well, you're definitely a part of our team. So we're in that, that Inwood Uptown community of artists. We're very proud to have, listen, high tide raises all boats. And I feel like we need more people like you um, and Ellen Mullen and everyone else who has been part of our um, little community. Uh, and, you know, keep joining folks. That's all to say, too, is that it, it's, it's, there's room for everybody. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, Let's keep collaborating. Let's keep finding ways to keep moving it forward and uh, and expanding and and keeping it sharp and truthful. Thank you. You bet. So, uh, listeners, you'll be able to find the links that Morella uh, spoke on on our on our description of this episode. So we'll make sure they're there for you. Uh, so thanks again. Ella, as I call her, <laughs> yes. uh, for joining me on this Artist Spotlight episode of Inwood Artworks On Air. It's where we meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes that make their home in what we affectionately call upstate Manhattan. Uh, if, you have a poem, if you have a moment, uh, please show us some love right now by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts. It really does help. And you can hear it everywhere. It's on Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever you listen to your podcasts, you can find us. So um, we really appreciate your support. Uh, many thanks to the Church of Good Shepherd and all the Catholics here at Uptown NY Inwood NYC, uh, this community for hosting us and making us feel welcome, and to HighTights.com for local Uptown promotional support. Uh, be sure to follow us on social media at InwoodArtworks.NYC uh, to keep up all that we do, uh, including the Inwood Film Festival, Filmworks Al Fresco, Public Art Galleries, live performances, and so much more. And you can support On Air and all of our programming by making a tax-free donation at InwoodArtworks.NYC backslash donate. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with City Council. From the top of Manhattan and the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for tuning in. This is Aaron Sims for Inwood Artworks On Air. <laughs>